Okay, excellent. I'm going to get my PowerPoint ready. Um, so I'd like to start by saying a huge thank you uh, for the opportunity to come and talk to you guys uh, tonight. Um, this is something that I'm very passionate about in terms of helping people that struggle with maths. I'd like to start by talking a bit about the Dyscalculia Network. As was mentioned earlier, it was formed in 2019 as a direct consequence because we just felt that maths wasn't being represented in the family of special educational needs. And Kat, Kat Edel and I are the co-founders and we're both maths specialists, maths teaching specialists. Uh, we like to work with people that struggle with maths, whether they be young, young people or old, older people in you know, different stages of their life. So we, we have four main sort of uh, areas of our key aims. The first one is to raise awareness of dyscalculia and maths difficulties. I still find it really strange when I go into different places and different schools and people really struggle to understand what dyscalculia is. And so often they can't pronounce the word. Uh, I always, for me, when I first started to hear about dyscalculia, um, I had to sort of keep thinking of it rhymes with Julia. We also have on our website um, a dyscalculia specialist directory. And this is for getting assessments, but it's also sort of providing that sort of tutor uh, recovery plan afterwards. You pop in in the UK, you pop in your postcode and it will give you a list of people in your local area and you can contact them and get sorted. We also want to advise and empower adults with dyscalculia mass difficulties, but also to work with professionals and also parents. And just more and more recently, we've realized that there isn't many people, there isn't enough people doing this. So we've set up a whole range of different training facilities in school, also locally to us in Oxfordshire. I wanted to sort of use this slide as a sort of um, an appreciation of just where dyscalculia is in within the family of special educational needs. Uh, this is uh, a piece of research that's been carried out by UCL. By uh, Rob. Yeah. Sorry, we can't see your slides yet. <laughs> just in case you're oh. um, um, at the bottom there should be a share share screen sorry okay. <laughs> sorry to interrupt no worries thank you okay so hopefully there you go yeah better? yeah perfect thank you cool. that's good so this is a piece of um, research by UCL in London and it just goes to show how behind dyscalculia is in, in terms of awareness of these different uh, special educational needs. Uh, Joe Van Herwig and did the research and it's really only been published in the last couple of weeks. So very, very recent stuff. Okay, so the prevalence of dyscalculia. It's a, it's a estimated that there's a proper, approximately 6% of the UK population has dyscalculia. And that's very similar to the numbers for dyslexia, 6%. In our presentations, we like to sort of, because dyscalculic struggle with understanding what 6% means. All of our sort of work has uh, been sort of looked at by accessible numbers. And we think that sort of having diagrammatic forms really helps people to understand numbers better. So it doesn't sound a lot, but to that, that's 4 million people in the UK, probably 1 million adults and 3 million children. So quite a huge amount. And it's about the same amount as people that live in Greater Birmingham, to give it in some context. This calculator doesn't often come on its own. Often comes, we say it comes with a friend. And it has a lot of co-occurrence with a lot of different uh, conditions. And sometimes it's really difficult to peel back, you know, what is impacting on your ability to do maths if you have dyslexia. And the British Dyslexia Association, quote, 60% people with dyslexia also have maths difficulties. 
that's quite a high number. But if you're um, dyslexic, then you're going to have trouble potentially understanding and comprehending what the word problem is, let alone before we even start doing the maths. Uh, dyspraxia may, might mean that you struggle to line up or present work neatly. So that makes it even more difficult to do things like column addition, column, column subtraction. So what is dyscalculia? So the current definition is defined as a specific and persistent understanding of numbers, which range, leads to a range of differences, difficulties with mathematics. I think the two key words there, specific and persistent, it's something that's it's not gonna go away and it's something that is more severe than your average range of mathematical difficulties. I think what's uh, really important here as well is it occurs across different age ranges. So uh, levels of education, you could be particularly bright. We've got one of our adult education uh, on our board, and we're gonna talk a bit about his experiences with dyscalculia. And it often occurs with other conditions as well. But if you think of maths difficulties as one long continuum, this calculus sits at the end of that line and it has a number of uh, causal factors that affects it. I think one of the things we have to do as educators is to make sure that we are aware of maths anxiety, of what it is, and that it's, that it's a different condition, the um, dyscalculia. So maths anxiety affects everybody, irrespective of um, age, um, where they live, and levels of education. But it, what is it? It's the panic, the helplessness, the paralysis that you get when having to do something involved with maths. Um, I went into a school a couple of weeks ago, and they couldn't understand in year four why they were... Um, <clears throat> on Thursday mornings, uh, pretty much 30% of their classes were off school. And they couldn't understand why until they sort of realized that's when they do their times table tests. So they people were like developing, they put it times table, stomach ache, things like that. So that's the physical side, maths anxiety. But I think more importantly, the psychological impacts, the loss of thought, uh, reducing self-confidence, thinking that you really are bad at maths. And I think over time, that sort of gets worse and worse. We have this thing called the maths anxiety cycle of failure, where you prepare badly, so you avoid doing any preparation for the next time, and you get even worse results. And over a period of time, that leads you to completely disengage with doing any maths at all. So I think what we have to do is look at the key indicators of maths difficulties. And we have to put this together in, in a form of a checklist. So I've made a list here of what we think is the main indicators of dyscalculia. So the first one is the inability to subitize, even very small quantities. Subitizing is the innate ability that we all have uh, when we don't have to count, say, up to four dots. With dyscalculic people, you'll find that they can't recognize that small cluster of objects and they will end up counting them and often touching them to sort of just to make sure that they're getting it right and not forgetting what the next number along is. So they'll do one, two, three, four. I mean, this subitizing is, is prevalent in the animal kingdom as well, where you may have mother duck looks around and she can see that the ducklings are behind her and she knows that they're all there. It's that innate ability to recognize four objects without sort of panicking. If one of them was missing, she would immediately realize and go looking for them. I think this calculates have really poor number sense. And that, that manifests itself with struggling with estimating or following patterns or identifying uh, sequences. Um, this means that when people have trouble estimating, they're not going to be able to judge accurately if their answer is reasonable. I think um, some of the dyscalculates that sit with us and work with us really hate it when people say to them, how long much do you think that cost? Or how long do you think it took me to drive there? Because they have no clue. They have no ability to estimate clearly 
So this is just putting pressure on people to sort of give an answer which they, they're not capable of doing. I think also dyscalculates suffer from slow processing speed. I think there's a, there's a prevalence in the uh, general public that being good at maths means being fast at maths, which is not necessarily the case. I've worked with lots of people that are quite competent mathematicians and enjoy maths, but they just take their time. They're much slower. I think the whole way that we our education system uh, is based on sort of doing things really fast in maths. We're not put under pressure in other topics at all. I think dyscalculates also have a what we call immature strategies. So they haven't moved on from counting up and back in ones. And they often use their fingers for counting. Finger counting is okay, but it just means that they haven't de developed into more sort of like uh, calculation strategies. So they're relying on counting in ones. That's okay for most people counting up in ones. They can do that quite quickly. But it's when you have to do subtraction and you're trying to count back in ones. Do I count from this number, the next number on? It leads to all sorts of inefficiencies and in inaccuracies. They tend to have a poor memory for facts and procedures. Uh, they're weak at making connections. So we think that it might be quite easy to see that a double four makes eight. And so you can add that together to make 18. But that's really difficult because it's a connection that they just don't have. We talked about the anxiety working around numbers. There's also a weakness in both the short-term and long-term memory. What you find is um, dyscalculics, or people that struggle with maths, really find it difficult to count backwards. Even simple counting back from 20, they'll often lose their place. It's that working memory for counting backwards. They have to hold in the number that they're on and then think about what's the next number in the sequence. That's often causes confusion. It's quite often with people with dyscalculia, they have lots of counting errors. And this is a, a typical error of counting up in tens. You may hear 60, 70, 80, 90, 20. Um, this, this is caused by a, a lack of understanding and awareness of the suffixes attached to the number. And I think when we're teaching, we have to make sure that we really differentiate between those two number families. The T families, like 20, 30, 40, that have really discriminated, uh, differentiated between those and the teen name, teen numbers, the 15 and 16. So we have really have to sort of differentiate the difference because otherwise this, this is what's going to occur. I think there's often a weakness in visual and spatial orientation. So, for example, on uh, column addition and subtraction, which way do we go? Do we go left? Do we go from the, uh, the, the right-hand side column or the left-hand side column? That's kind of all that happens quite a lot. It also means that um, when we're writing numbers, we often see numbers that are flipped around the wrong way. So a two presents itself as a number five and vice versa. Um, that's difficult enough when we have single digits, but when we have double digits, 25 written backwards, who knows what the number is? So it causes lots of confusion. We also have uh, directional confusion where a, uh, 23 might be written as 32. And so we have to teach people, adults, explicitly what the two represents. Here, these are two tens, and we need to use concrete materials to show that using these rods and uh, Dean's blocks to show that it's not a two, it's a 20. And we have two 10 sticks to show that. We have difficulty sequencing. And I think kind of maths has its own language that makes things really difficult. There's so many different words that mean the same thing. And so many words that are only available within the subject of maths, which makes it really tricky. Um, the one that gets me is that the difference between, it doesn't sound like you should, the number's getting smaller. So I think most of my students always have trouble understanding what the mass processes involve, working out the difference between two numbers. There's often poor memory for facts and procedures. Uh, difficulties in word problems and multi-step calculations. You know, there could be an effect from their dyslexia. There could be an effect from working memory issues where they really find it difficult to do multi-step calculations. They're almost 
already looking at what the art, what I'm trying to get to the final answer rather than working out one step at a time. I think problems with all aspects of money is quite prevalent. Um, luckily or unluckily, we, we don't really spend as much time uh, with money these days. Being able to tap is quite dangerous, I suppose, in a way for budgeting purposes and really doesn't give us a grasp of how much money we have left at all. There's also a marked delay in, tele in learning to tell the time. I think with the prevalence of um, uh, digital phones, um, most of the people that learn to tell the time these days are doing digital time and really struggle with any sort of form of analog time, which doesn't make sense in the same way. So who, who can diagnose dyscalculia? When we set up the network initially, we, we both teach it in schools and higher education colleges. And we didn't really realize the impact that this is gonna have for adults in the wider um, general public. But we've been inundated with adults saying, all of those things you described, that's me. How can I get an assessment? So we set up this, um, you can go to an educational psychologist or you can go and get a specific maths uh, assessment and diagnosis from an accredited assessor who's done the dyscalculia um, course. Sometimes if, it's, if you've got wider issues other than just maths, an educational psychologist might be your route to go. Or if it's specifically your issues are with maths, it might be better to sort of get a, a level seven accredited assessor because they can focus on the maths rather than the general cognitive things that are going on across your profile. So I like this slide because I think uh, these are the, this is the crux of the matter of why uh, maths is hard to learn. It's a very abstract subject to learn. There's, as I said before, there's lots of language and stuff that's only available in um, maths and not involved in other, other topics. And there's a, the visual spatial aspect, thinking, I'm thinking about 2D, 3D shapes, uh, trying to explain the difference between what's the area and what's, what's the volume. You know, that sort of thing is quite complex uh, for someone to understand. But I think the way maths is taught in schools and colleges uh, leaves a lot to be desired. The emphasis is on speed, as I mentioned before. And I think kind of what we need, because it's so abstract, I think we really need to go back, peel back and go back to using concrete resources, you know, demonstrating what is, what is number 10 actually made of? If we can use blocks and materials to demonstrate the relationship between two numbers that combine together to make 10. That's, that's the true aspect of number 10. What does capacity mean? What is volume? You know, if I'm looking at a, a cube, I can see, that, or a packet, I can see that the volume is everything that goes inside that 3D shape. I think there's not enough repetition. I think the syllabus is too big. Um, in, in all of the colleges we teach, I think we have to just make sure that we, there's enough repetition to go over stuff. I like to use maths games as a way of reinforcing topics that I teach. I think it's really important and it gives makes a fun element of what we're doing, but also it tells you a lot of information. But uh, the worst thing is to rely on rote learning, you know, learning times tables by rote. It's not really um, a way of teaching mathematics. It's, uh, it's a memory test. It's like uh, the equivalent of learning the capital cities of, say, Europe or, or, or the states, the state capitals. It doesn't sort of help you develop in terms of your understanding of mathematics. I went into a, a school where they were really hot on learning our times tables as fast as they could and they'd try and do as many questions as they could in 45 seconds and they had a leaderboard on the wall and you know i thought great if you're at the top of this leaderboard but how much do you feel if you're at the bottom you can't do anything about it so the teacher got this person out who's at the top of this leaderboard and i asked him questions what was they were working on the eight times table so i asked him what's 10 times eight and he's able to give me a really quick answer. 11 times 8, quick answer. 12 times, I have no clue. So he failed to understand about the 
um, the way that multiplication is like repeated addition and just really struggled with anything above what he'd learned. So I think kind of what I, the way that we uh, try and teach maths and try and view maths is maths is a very much a modular topic. It relies on really um, key foundational stones to be able to put in place to be able to do further advanced topics. And we have this sort of like, um, uh, we've had this, I'll go on to that in a minute, but go, <laughs> talking of rote learning, I, I love this slide as well. This is um, taken from something from the 60s. Um, and it's where we were expected to learn multiplications up to 25 times 25 uh, by rote. You have to learn them off by heart. And that just makes me get so anxious. I don't know about you, but um, it's the equivalent of today of like a, a 10, 100 square times tables. Um, going back to the modular form. So we've developed this thing called the Jenga effect. And it's a way of looking at the profile of an individual with dyscalculia. On the left here, this particular tower is um, a typical uh, dyscalculic student where struggling with the key foundation aspects of maths. They didn't quite get some of the key areas. They don't understand division. Division is one of the things they don't like at all. So their brick has been taken out and put on, put on top. And they've been asked to do fractions. Um, they've got completely no clue to be able to do that because they can't simplify. They can't sort of make the fractions smaller and more simple because they're missing that key understanding of division. And I think kind of what happens in a lot of um, adult education and also in schools is that we, we pitch the intervention at the wrong area. We have to sort of like investigate where things are starting to fall apart and start from there and build upwards. Because what we're trying to sort of, you know, we're trying to build firm foundations to be able to put a structured approach. And then that allows us to do much more advanced maths that we can sort of then build on. So this Jenga effect is quite a sort of a good analogy of explaining that modularity of maths. So what builds us firm foundations? <clears throat> I think we have to, as with individuals, we have to be on the lookout for maths difficulties. Um, we need to assess where the individual really is with their current knowledge and understanding. I think there is not really any good tests out there at the moment to help with that. That's why Jane Emerson and I have, have just finished um, uh, a publication that's going to be coming out in the autumn now, where it will give you a complete picture of your ability in, in foundation maths, say going up to, um, to, uh, to algebra. So it's a brilliant test. It's an open test, but it gives you sort of all of the information you need to be able to decide where the intervention is going to happen. And we need to peel, as educators, we need to peel back to the, the level where things are starting to go wrong, no matter how old the person is or what they've done or how successful they've been in business. I think it's really important to address these foundation areas. Right? And we also like to use the concrete, pictorial, verbalized, abstract approach. It's quite a, quite a mouthful. Um, but I think it's important to sort of develop from concrete materials to see how things work, the interrelationship between numbers. We use a lot of um, um, dice patterns to sort of demonstrate how things work. And what an actual, what does a number five actually mean? For some people, it's, it's like a foreign language. It's a, it doesn't just mean anything. But having that sort of pattern in your mind of that dice pattern for five is really important because you can then start saying, well, I, I know it's made of these five dots. And I can then start working that, oh, five, I can take three and two. If five is made of three and two or four and one. And so you can start to see what the numbers are made up of to sort of start with your early calculation. It also is important you can then start taking away. So I've got five dots there. I'm going to take one away. I'm left with four. So it gives you that sort of idea, that visual identity, a visual hook to be able to understand and manipulate and play with numbers. Um, scaffold learning is really important because 
I think as the Jenga tower tells us, we can't really sort of jump around. In a typical school or in a typical college, we're doing like lots of different stuff, but they're all interrelated. You know, there's no way without being um, successfully able to subtract to work for a higher level geometry to find missing angles. You just won't be able to do that. So we have to sort of make as um, pictorial as possible, encourage the drawing of diagrams to explain different problems. And also we need to break things down really small because you know most of these learners are really struggling and they really like don't like maths. And so we want to make lots of small successes. We want to encourage success rather than failure. Oh, I, just, um, I, I wish I had a pound for every time I said someone said to me, oh, I just, I just don't do maths, I can't do maths. And what they mean is they can't do maths fast or they've not taught it in that sort of modular way where they can develop stuff moving forward. So the best way to progress uh, using our understanding is it has to be understanding based. You see lots of pictures here using concrete materials. We've got algebra tiles, we've got uh, uh, dice patterns, we've got quiz and air rods. All of these things really does help to form a basic understanding of what maths means. These concrete materials are really important. It, this what picture on the top right, this is a, a new way of, of teaching negative numbers. So you have a number of uh, negative, they call negative pairs, which uh, take each other out, leaving just the minus three or the positive three left behind. Uh, it needs to be carefully structured. It helps individuals to reason effectively, a bit like the times tables. Understanding that we'll go on to that in a minute in, um, in terms of step counting. So if you can't think of something immediately, you can use known facts if I know what uh, 10 times 8 is, is 80, then 9 lots of 8 will be 80 take away an 8 because I know that the multiplication is repeated addition and subtraction. So I can use that effectively to get to my answer. And I don't have to overburden uh, a memory situation which I find kind of struggling anyway. I think um, use the language the person understands um, and then slowly but surely introduce different te terminologies to mean the same thing. They get used to that. But I think it's stick to what they know to, to start with. <clears throat> I think it's really important, as in all topics, to encourage um, active participation in, in whatever you're teaching. And we try and make game uh, maths as fun as possible by, all, by introducing questions, what they're really into. So, um, uh, I was teaching uh, at an uh, adult education centre uh, last year, and um, the, people, the guys that were in this course were really into antiques. So all of the percentage questions, all of those questions, the subtraction questions, working out what the problem was, the profit margins, they're all kind of based on antiques. And these guys loved it. They really were into that. And so it kind of made them want to, want to find out. So that active participation is really important. And we use a lot of maths games. There's, we think we have a maths game for pretty much every topic. And there's lots on our website to download. So please just go there and help yourself. Um, and we have to look at sort of the, the rounded person about, you know, people that struggle and avoid maths have always had uh, negative emotions surrounded that because they have struggled. And I think once when you kind of realize that you have to do things in small steps and encourage success, I think you need to, that's really important. So I just wanted to quickly look at, um, so the key areas for calculation here, I'm just going to focus on the multiplication division. Okay, so when we're teaching multiplication division, are we testing our times tables? Are we doing understanding of that or are we teaching for memory? We teach, we should be teaching for understanding. And if, if so, we should uh, view multiplication as repeating addition from known facts. There's a whole host of prerequisite skills needed before we'd even start teaching that. That's the Jenga effect. Uh, introduce the different languages, stick with initially with what you've known. 
So these prerequisites. So in order to move up and down the times tables, you have to be capable of adding and subtracting. We have to know bonds for 10. We look at doubling and halving, bridging through 10. So if we're using the tens, the 10 times multiples of 10, our calculations are going to be much easier. Adding and subtracting from a tens number. So if I'm adding uh, 10 plus 5, I need to know and feel comfortable that's going to give me 15. If I do 10 take away 5, I need to know that that's part of the number bonds. And so it's going to give an answer of 5. So step counting forwards and back, backwards with key vocabulary as well, really important. I think with multiplication as well, we all know that multiplication is commutative, but I think when you first started teaching and understanding how multiplication works, I like to sort of lock it into place. because, And I, do, I try not to initially use the word times, because that's bad connotations with analog timing. So I tend to use groups of or lots of to sort of show me uh, how this works. The first number is always how many, six, and the second number would always be the number that I'm working in. So here, it'll be six lots of five, because we're working in the five times table. And I think that stabilizes people's thinking and that image in their head. The first number is always how many, and the second number is the times table. It will also be a, bear a close resemblance to how we would teach division. So that's how many groups of five. And we have keys to the times tables. And for example, going back to our um, eight times table, a lot of people that would make, they find it really difficult for the eight. But the keys to that times table would always be in this order, 10 times eight, 80. Five times we choose that key so that uh, that's half of 10. So half of 80 would be 40. And then the last key is two times, which is also a double. So we've got three keys there, and we can step count up and down from there to get our answers. I want to know what nine times eight is, nine groups of eight, uh, nine groups of eight. Well, I know 10 times eight from the keys is 80. So nine times eight will be 80 take away eight. So I'm step counting. Or if I want to know what uh, six times eight is, I know from the keys that five times eight is 40, so six, will be 40 plus one more eight. Um, often people understand the uh, step counting nature. They'll go, well, I'll go one times, two times eight, three times eight, four times eight, five times eight, and then six times eight. What we're saying is we can use these milestones. It means they don't have to do six calculations. You're going from nearest known fact. And it's really a, a nice way of sort of working through um, the times tables because it works simply for all times tables. Five is always half of whatever ten times is, and you know doubles, and it's one of the key skills of working on doubling and halving. So just to sort of reiterate, we always use the same keys for any times table, and we step count to find what we want to know. So it's reasoning from known facts. So for division. Uh, I think to start with, we have to be aware there's two models. Grouping, where the quantity in each group is known. Uh, if there's 12 girls and they need to get into teams of three, it means there's going to be four teams. Sharing is possibly the first division practice we do, really in, in early years education, where we'll have a number of biscuits and we'll be sharing them out, depending on who is allowed to eat that particular biscuit. We'll be sharing on that, but grouping is the model that we we like to teach because it has really uh, strong connotations and similarities with the um, multiplication. And I think division shouldn't necessarily be taught as a separate subject. It needs to be taught almost at the same time as multiplication, because it's the same sort of question. It's repeated subtraction, whereas multiplication is repeated addition. And again, use lots of concrete materials bowls so we can sort of take and physically see how many uh, uh, counters in each bowl. We've got three counters so we can see how many bowls are needed. And it's like divided 15 divided by three, we can use a number line to show the number of jumps. 
um, uh, here we're talking about relating um, p to the subtraction. 30 divided by 5, we can use 30 counters and see how many groups of 5 I can make with. But that's like coming down the number line. So it's 30, take away 5, take away 5, take away 5. But just how many 5s, how many groups of 5 are there in 30? So that's, that's multiplication. So here we've got 18 divided by 6. Well, it's, it, the question really is, how many groups of 6 make 18? It's a multiplication question. And I've had lots of people say to me, well, I can, I'm really good at time table, understand the process, but I can't do division. What we're saying is if they're taught together as the inverse relationship, it makes so much more sense. And it's using your times table knowledge to answer division questions. So I'd like to just say a little bit about mass games. We said before about we, we love to sort of use them. They're really good. Uh, but it's important to use the right games. You know, the person has to that you're doing the game will have to sort of be really comfortable and understand kind of the objectives of the game. We have to make sure that the, the game doesn't cause any anxiety. You know, we don't want the person to keep on losing. I suppose that's what's good about playing against your teacher because you can always affect the outcome. My students always um, have a good chance of winning most of the games with me. Um, because it means that they've beaten the maths teacher, so they must be good. Uh, we also need to make sure that they're not under any pressure for a quick answer. Instant recall and rote learning don't work for learners with dyscalculia and maths difficulties. <clears throat> so some of the benefits, they don't really realise that they're learning. So you're revising a, some, a topic here. So we have a place value game here. We've got a uh, 10 dice uh, and a unit dice and here we've thrown the numbers together and we've created that number and we can see that 43 divided by 10 is 4 of a remainder of 3 so we're physically able to see that and they don't realise they're learning they're generally more productive as well at the end of a long day the last thing you want to do is to sort of sit down and, and bash for a whole series of worksheets you much rather play a few games uh, to where the teacher can see, you know, if you've got it or not. I, I use games to reinforce skills uh, a lot of the time uh, because it's sort of that practice, having fun is really quite effective. They're less likely to give up in a game setting. Um, I, you know, I've, I've seen people given like a whole worksheet full of questions and just give up because I can't do this question. Um, I'm a slow worker as it is I, i'm just going to struggle uh, like i said before you can uh, ensure a positive outcome for the learner so you balance up how many times that you win the games and how many times they win the games um i think also here is games can be differentiated to different groups so in, in a classroom wide thing if you've got people that are particularly stronger at something uh than others uh, you could play the same game, but differentiate it so that everyone feels like they're playing the same game. But you might have different questions on their spinner than on the, on the table to where the person is maybe a bit more struggling with that particular concept. So you can differentiate it. I think there's instant feedback for the learner as well. They know if they're struggling with to answer some of the questions for the games. This, this game here on the left-hand side, this is uh, Area Tetris, and it's really a, a nice way of explaining the whole concept of area. So all you do is you throw two dice, and you, you have two numbers. If you get a six and a five, you have to draw that aperture on, on one side is five, and one side is six. And then you keep on going with whatever you throw in the dice to try and maximize use of your side of the page until someone can't go anymore and then you add up the number of squares that are left on there so really simple but effective game i think games also help to as we talked about before reduce maths anxiety and the overall improvement in confidence of the individual learner here's another game connect four four in a row what you're doing is always uh, um, you're revising what's a vertical line what's a horizontal line Show me what diagonal lines are. So they're not just passive games. You're uh, openly answering questions and 
you know, trying to sort of find out what's missing in their knowledge. Uh, again, two dice here. You have the first one to get four in a row. You throw the two dice, you add them together for the one on the left, subtract them for the one on the right. Uh, bingo. So working on any multiplication packs here. And you're trying, again, you're trying to get four in a row. But it's a kind of like, so even though it's a four times table bingo thing, I think what number do I have to roll to get that eight covered? It's a division question. And again, it highlights the sort of reinforces that sort of uh, um, information about um, division of the inverse relation to a multiplication and, and fun. You can just do whatever table you're working on. There's lots of, it's easy to make up these grids. Um, I'd just like to finish by talking about um, a friend and colleague, uh, Peter Cherry. Uh, Peter's uh, head of our adult advisory board, uh, who's really bright. He's a, he's just qualified as a PhD in, um, in English. And all he's wanted to do is to teach English. But the sort of strange kind of um, uh, the qualifications you need, you need a maths GCSE to be able to teach English in the UK. And he's failed it four or five times. <clears throat> he really struggles reading numbers. He, he can never do mental math. Uh, you know, people kind of accept the fact that he has a calculator with him all the time, which is really helpful. That's what assistive tech is there for. He has no concept for what percentages or fractions actually mean. He told me that um, he goes out regularly for uh, the same the same restaurant with his two best buddies, and when the bill comes, he kind of makes his way to the bathroom uh, politely. Um, but he came back a little bit too early, and and the, um, the restaurant manager gave him the card machine to be able to put a tip in. Obviously, not knowing anything about percentages, he just decided to press a few buttons. So, well, well that, that's done. And then a few minutes later, the uh, restaurant manager came back over to him and said, um, excuse me, sir, I know we have a really good service here, but you've just given a 100% tip. It literally doubled the bill overnight. Um, and so that's what happens to people with this calculator, that where they have no idea of percentages. He, he can only memorize numbers if they're associated with something like um, a, a famous battle or something's happened like um, a Battle of Waterloo 1815. He can only sort of also you imagine at work in a workplace scenario where he can't remember pins, yeah, he gets locked out to stop them, all sorts of things that go on. Uh, he struggles with budgeting and he's really anxious with money. He just doesn't, he's not aware of what he's spending or how much he's got left. He has difficulty with time, so at meetings he's always either really, really early or really, really late. There's no in between. Uh, and like I said before, estimating numbers. Uh, but overall, a lack of awareness of this calculus had a huge impact on his mental health. And he feels ashamed to fail his GCSE maths so many times. And it's kind of crazy. So Thank you very much. Um, we have a, a lot of information on our website. Uh, and if there's any questions that I don't answer, I see that there's quite a few in the chat, which is great. If there's yeah. anything um, not I haven't covered today, um, please drop us an email through the website info at uh, network.com and we'll get back to you definitely. Thank you, Rob.